Well, our title for today comes from a book that we encountered a few years back uh, called The Big Picture by Sean Carroll um, on the origins of life, meaning, and the universe itself. Wow, that's a, that's a, big, that's a big topic. He is a theoretical physicist who specializes in quantum mechanics, gravitation, and cosmology. And he is my go-to guy whenever I hear someone misusing and abusing the term quantum mechanics. For example, by using it to explain perhaps why uh, angels dance on the head of a pin or stuff like that. You hear things like that a lot, right? Somebody makes this claim, oh, quantum mechanics, right? He's the guy. So. Uh, he works as a professor at Caltech down in Pasadena, and he's an advocate of this worldview that he calls poetic naturalism, which means that from a scientific standpoint, there's only one universe, the natural universe, which operates according to one set of rules, which can be discerned through observation and experimentation. There, there isn't one set of rules for stuff over here and a different set of rules for things over here. And since we're here at a place that we call unity, you know, where we like to say one presence and one power, that idea should be welcome. Physical, spiritual, are aspects of the same thing, of the same reality, governed by one set of natural laws. And poetic naturalism takes the additional step of acknowledging that even though there's one universe and one set of rules, there are many valid ways of talking about it. When it comes to intangible things like truth, goodness, and beauty, or, or, or meaning, purpose, and values, we tend to use poetic language. We, we speak symbolically, we speak metaphorically. Our poetic language and especially our stories can, can point to the truth. It's a way that we use to try to describe the indescribable. And to see a book by a, a theoretical physicist embracing the idea of poetic language and, and talking about meaning and values I think is groundbreaking. Because for too long, the scientific world avoided any talk of meaning, values, truth, goodness, beauty. They left those very important subjects to the realm of philosophy, which isn't exactly accessible to most people. And, and, and even worse, when, when science abandons the playing field, when science abandons the topics of meaning and values, what often happens is that religions take over. And they can often make an incoherent mess of the whole thing. Now, it, too often, and we've seen this, too often religion tries to stake out its territory by opposing the work of science. Um, one of the things that they like to say is that, well, science is, is too cold, too mechanical, too amoral, things like that. It's almost like we would uh, turn into copies of of Mr. Spock from Star Trek overnight if we were to follow a scientific worldview, right? Unemotional, logic, logical to a fault, to a fault, mind you, unfeeling, right? Those are all the things they used to say about, about Mr. Spock, especially Dr. McCoy, right? Used to just, just lay into him all the time. And none of that's true, right? It's simply not true. In fact, tr truth be told, Mr. Spock, was something of a party animal. As we can see here, Party Spock is in the house tonight. Everybody have a logical time. He was definitely, definitely on the A-list for all of the best parties that were out there. So it's just not true. And, and what the facts and the evidence actually show us is that, hey, hey, we've been immersed in a modern scientific age for a long time now, and none of that has come to pass, right? Take a look around the world and it's clear that human beings are just as emotional, illogical, and passionate as ever, right? Maybe not always a good thing, but the point is that our living conditions have improved and the human condition is basically unchanged. 
There are things to cherish and preserve, and there are other things that maybe we can change. Some things that perhaps need to be tweaked a little bit. You know, one of the attractive things about this idea of poetic uh, naturalism is that it promises that we won't lose our humanity. In fact, quite the opposite. We won't cease to be human, and maybe we'll actually find a new depth of humanity. We'll find a new depth of meaning in what it uh, is to be human. Now, I made, a, I made a Star Trek reference there earlier, and I just love watching science fiction shows on TV. I mean, I grew up with Star Trek and, and all of the spin-offs from day one over 50 years ago until all of the different shows they have out there now. And they, they hop around the galaxy, they, they visit hundreds of different planets, and they meet new species and, and life forms. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to stretch the imagination and to enjoy a good story. But the truth is, we'll be lucky if we ever get to Mars in another lifetime. And I mean, forget about other solar systems, right? The cold, hard truth is that we can't travel faster than light. And don't say quantum mechanics or I'll send you to Sean Carroll. <laughs> there, there's no warp drive. But that doesn't mean that we can't still enjoy the science fiction and fantasy stories. You know, the interesting thing about Star Trek is that despite all the science and technology, the phasers, the transporters, the warp drives and mind melds, they still have all of the same human problems that we deal with today. And those are the things that drive the stories. You know, in some ways their problems are a little more complicated, but they all still boil down to stuff like fear, prejudice, bigotry, greed, jealousy, ethical dilemmas and stuff like that. And the solutions are still things like honesty, integrity, open communication, building healthy relationships, empathy, compassion. I could go on and on. In the Star Trek world, the arts are still important, maybe even more important. Music, poetry, literature, things like that. I mean, look at this. Captain Picard still loves playing his flute, right? Riker is a trombonist in a jazz band. Let's see who we have next. Uh, oh, Dr. Crusher teaches tap dancing and other forms of dance. There she's trying to teach the android Data how to tap dance. That was a good one. And Data himself um, plays violin. Uh, actually, he's a, he's, a, he's a concert violinist. Um, it may be fiction, but it's optimistic fiction, which is one of the reasons why these stories are still so popular. In fact, I have to plug, as long as we're on the topic, I have to plug a brand new series coming out next year. If you're a Star Trek fan, you better be looking forward to Star Trek Picard, which is coming out. There's no date yet, but I've heard it's a done deal. You can watch the trailer. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to be epic. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Human beings, we love telling stories. We love listening to stories. Um, in fact, one of the quotes that's used in the book, The Big Picture, comes from the poet Muriel Rukeyser. She once wrote, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. All right? Sean Carroll, the theoretical physicist, says she's absolutely correct and that there is more to the world than what happens. There are the ways we make sense of it by telling its story. The vocabulary that we use is not handed to us from outside. It's ultimately a matter of our choice. The vocabulary that we use is a matter of our choice. One of the things that uh, many of those Star Trek stories tell us is that we are always going to be making choices about how we deal with the concepts of right and wrong, morality and ethics. And we're totally on our own when it comes to making those choices. I hate to break this to you, but the universe doesn't care. <laughs> the universe is basically indifferent to what we do. I mean, if we should succeed somehow in destroying this planet, 
and everything on it, well, the rest of the universe is going to carry on without us, just like uh, we'd never been here. And, on the other hand, if we should succeed in creating heaven on earth, the rest of the universe is going to carry on just the same as it did before. The universe doesn't care, but we do. You see, that's the important thing. The universe doesn't care, but we do. We care, and that's what makes all the difference. I mean, this puts the responsibility right back where it belongs with us. No excuses. One of the things, having done this work for a long time now, one of the things that people find most challenging about unity is the degree of personal responsibility that it requires. Ethical living isn't just a matter of following a set of arbitrary commandments. It has to go deeper than that. It requires the long and scary work of practicing self-awareness, seeing all of those little shadow places within ourselves, and looking at how we show up in the world and being willing to, to speak the truth to ourselves about what we see. Um, in the book, Dr. Carroll says it like this. He says, deciding how to be good isn't like solving a math puzzle or discovering a new fossil. It's like going out to dinner with a group of friends. We think about what we want for our individual selves we talk to others about their desires and how we can work together and reason about how to make it happen. The group may include both vegetarians and omnivores, with a few vegans thrown in there too, I'm sure. But with a good faith effort, there's no reason everyone can't be satisfied. It doesn't get handed down from above. We have to figure it out among ourselves, and in many cases, wrestle with it. Just the opposite of what traditional religion tries to do, which allows no questions, no discussion, just blind obedience, as if we're not capable of anything else. And in unity, we beg to disagree. And we want to offer alternatives, because we can think for ourselves. And one of the alternatives I'd like to recommend here this morning comes from an organization that's called the Society for Ethical Culture. The Society for Ethical Culture was started back in 1877 by Felix Adler, who was a professor at Cornell in Columbia where he taught uh, political and social ethics. Political ethics. Sounds a bit like an oxymoron, you know, but <laughs> at least they were trying, right? At least they were trying. Um, Adler believed that people could be good, they could be moral and ethical without the need for religion and theology. And the key for him was to emphasize action instead of belief, or as he would say, deeds and not creeds. His organization was based in New York City, all right, so it gave him a real good chance to, to, to walk the talk. Um, his organization aimed at serving the poor and especially children living in poverty. So they would offer nursing services for sick people uh, who were in tenement communities. They established a free kindergarten where children received early education, along with food, clothing. Um, they championed child labor reform and housing regulations that were designed to establish basic standards of safety and sanitation in the New York tenements. And Adler's ideas were all based on what he called a supreme ethical rule, which goes like this. Act so as to bring out the best in others and thereby in yourself. It's a variation on the golden rule, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and he also taught that virtue, being good, is and must be its own reward or else it's not really virtue which was a real departure from the reward and punishment mentality that was taken by most religions and uh, most social systems back then. Fear-based, right? If you're not good, you'll be punished. And if you are good, then you'll get a cookie, or you know, the, the equivalent of the cookie. Has to be its own reward. Now in the United States today, 
Um, and this is something that I wasn't really aware of until about five or six years ago. This organization called the, uh, uh, the uh, Ethical Communities, they're operating 25 centers around the nation as part of what they call ethical culture. Um, sounds small, but that's because they don't go door to door, um, you know, uh, promising heaven and eternal life in exchange for saying you believe in something, right? They don't have that model. They don't go around proselytizing. And if you were to visit one on a Sunday, from what I've read, you find that they have a, they have a service, they have a community gathering. Um, they may be small in number, but the real power, as always, is not in numbers, but in the ideas. And when I look at the guiding principles that they're advancing, I see something that's powerful, something that's, that's worth looking at, the, the core values of the American Ethical Union. And we put them in the handout in your bulletin. Um, I was thinking that maybe these could serve as useful ideas, as guidelines, as maybe talking points, uh, things that we can talk about in the, in the process of deciding how to be good and maybe to treat it as that conversation among friends that Dr. Carroll described. So listen to these and, and see how many of these speak to you. Every person is important and unique. Every person deserves to be treated fairly and kindly. I can learn from everyone. I am part of this earth. I cherish it and all life upon it. And of course, these come to us from a long time ago. We now know that we'll, we're actually a part of virtually everything in the universe that's known to us. I learn from the world around me using my senses, my mind, and my feelings. I am a member of the world community which depends on the cooperation of all people for peace and justice. I can learn from the past to build for the future. I am free to question. I am free to choose what I believe. I accept responsibility for my choices and actions. I strive to live my values. I view ethics as my religion. So there it is. And I, for one, am done with entrusting these important matters to holy books and holy men, or, or, or holy women for that matter. Um, this is a message that may require a high degree of personal responsibility and self-awareness, but the reward is a degree of, of freedom and integrity that this old world desperately needs right now. And we get to hang on to our great stories. Well, that's all for today. Um, next week, I hope you come back because we have an old friend joining us again next Sunday. Anybody remember Kelly Garmeyer who used to sing here yeah. a few years back? Kelly's going to be back with us next week, and uh, we will be carrying on with uh, more interesting stuff. See you then.